All right, thanks everyone. My name is Ryan Johnson, and today I'm going to be giving a talk called Still Vulnerable Out of the Box, revisiting the security of prepaid Android carrier devices, and I collaborated with Angelo Stavro and Mohamed El Sabag for this research. Uh, so today, just the agenda, we're going to start off talking about Android, then look at some of the preloaded software, then we'll move on to applications and their application components. After that, we'll move to uh, application uh, IPC. Then we'll get to the core of the talk, which is vulnerabilities in prepaid Android carrier devices. After that, we'll move to some CTE-specific vulnerabilities. And then we'll zoom out a little bit, look at some of the vulnerability root causes, move on to how to secure s the software, and rack it, wrap it up with some conclusions. And this talk is somewhat like a continuation of the talk we gave at DEF CON 26 in 2018, essentially on the same topic, looking at vulnerabilities in Android prepaid carrier devices, so five years later, just showing that the issue still persists. Uh, so we, we all work for Quaka, which is uh, previously known as CryptoWire. Uh, we were jump-started in 2011 uh, on a DARPA project. We've also worked with DHS S&T, NIST, and at Quaka we do uh, software assurance, developer integration, uh, personal device management, firmware testing, threat feed, and security analytics. So prepaid smartphones. These are going to be smartphones that you generally purchase uh, in full price uh, at the time of purchase, and you generally get a uh, prepaid service contract. This is going to be a fixed term uh, service contract, usually one, maybe to three months. Some of these smartphones are typically on the low end, so they could be anywhere from $50 up to maybe three or $400. Uh, the major American carriers have a presence in the prepaid smartphone market. You can see there's a picture there from Walmart showing uh, T-Mobile. Uh, AT&T, as well as Verizon. So in the prepaid uh, market, Verizon has a large presence since they own Total by Verizon, which used to be called Total Wireless. They also own TrackPhone, as well as Straight Talk. Uh, so Android is uh, developed and maintained by Google, so they make the uh, source code available through the Android Open Source Project, also known as AOSP. Uh, so Android is an open ecosystem where vendors can take a, a version of Android, fork it, and then modify it to provide uh, extra hardware and software features, which uh, gives them kind of a differentiation in the market and a competitive advantage. And this is good since it gives you something beyond uh, plain vanilla Android, but it also requires some scrutiny from a security perspective. Uh, some of the major Android vendors have their own security bulletin, so if there's a, a vulnerability in their own code which is not present in AOSP, um, then they will list it on their security bulletin. And Android, it's the most popular mobile OS in the world at 70.8%, and in America with 42%. So when you have an Android device, various uh, entities are going to provide some software. So there's AOSP, which is at the core of it from Google. There's going to be the chipset manufacturer and the hardware manufacturer. They're going to add some uh, uh, hardware components as well as some software components. If it's a carrier device, they usually put on some software as well. There's the vendor, which does the customization. And then there's also vendor partners, which is anyone from Netflix to Facebook to some app you've never heard of that doesn't have a launcher uh, or an app icon. So pre-installed software, this is necessary to make your device more functional than just a brick. Uh, so some, some of the software is necessary, some of it is value added where the vendor thinks that you will find this useful. So pre-installed software has more, uh, is more trusted and is, has more privileges than third-party applications because it's specifically curated by uh, the device or the vendor or OEM. Uh, so pre-installed applications get special access to permissions. They can run as certain uh, special UIDs and run system services. And on Android, uh, processes are bound by an SE Linux domain as well as the rules uh, that apply to that domain. And uh, a lot of this uh, pre-installed software uh, may contain insecure interfaces, which third-party apps that you download uh, can interact with. And in Android, the main IPC mechanism is called an intent. And you can think of this as a message with a destination as well as some embedded data. 
So Android applications, when you install them, they're, they have their own uh, user ID as well as uh, group ID, which are assigned at installation time. And this helps to provide a, a sandbox for the application's files and resources. Uh, in Android, applications are identified using a package name. This is generally uh, reverse domain notation. And in Android, applications get access to data and capabilities using permissions. So an application will declare what permissions it needs. And there's different levels of permissions. Normal permissions are granted to an application upon installation. And then dangerous permissions are, they at least for third party applications, to get them, they have to provide uh, the prompt the user with either an accept or reject uh, dialog. And uh, a user can also download an app and assign it to a specific role. So maybe you download an app, you want it to be the, the default VPN, or you want it to be the default messenger, or a notification listener. This is again done through the GUI. And Android apps are not monolithic. They're, uh, you can decompose them into individual units called application components. In an Android, uh, they provide an activity, which is essentially a, a user, user interface that the user can interact with, service for long running tasks, broadcast receiver registers for events, uh, somewhat like an event listener, and a content provider provides access to uh, structured data. So application components, they can be started independently, they can run concurrently, and they perform dedicated tasks. And all apps in Android have a manifest file, and this is somewhat like a specification, which has their package name, version information, permissions they request, listing of application components, and any hardware or software requirements. And for an external app to interact with uh, uh, application component in another file. This is dictated by three attributes, which are listed in uh, the manifest for the declaration of an app component. Uh, Android exported needs to be true. Android enables like can't be false. And an application component can set a permission, which is like an access permission. So for an external app to interact with it, to send it a message, it needs to possess that permission. So here are some ways that uh, some IPC mechanisms either done directly or indirectly. Uh, many of these are provided by Binder in Android. Uh, some of the ones we'll talk about today are intents, bound services, and network sockets. So the threat model is uh, a local application that has either zero or one normal level permission. And a normal level permission is granted to the application upon installation. And the application, based on that uh, zero or one permission, appears limited and, and constrained. Uh, they we're not requiring any uh, user interaction beyond installing and running a, th a third party application once. And then once this application is run, it turns to its environment and interacts with uh, insecure interfaces of uh, co-located software on the device, uh, generally through intense uh, bound services and sockets. So onto the carrier devices, we looked at 21 uh, Android carrier devices. They are grouped by uh, carrier, showing the, uh, the vendor as well as the model. Uh, so you can see TrackPhone is uh, pretty well represented because they're a pretty big player in the uh, prepaid market. And here is a, a summary of the vulnerabilities uh, in these devices. So 86% of them leak non-resettable device identifiers to system properties. 81% uh, of them leak the GPS coordinates to uh, a loopback port, uh, like a debug port uh, on TCP port 7000. 9% uh, of the devices expose an arbitrary file read and write as a system uh, UID. There's also 24% of them are impacted by a factory reset. And this is when essentially you wipe the user's apps, the app data, as well as the settings. So if you have any data that isn't backed up or synced externally, your data is gone forever. So the user can experience uh, data loss. There's also arbitrary AT command execution, which an AT command is a command that's sent to the baseband processor, which is executed by the modem. 24% of the devices were impacted. And most severe is arbitrary command execution as a system UID, and 9% uh, of the devices uh, were impacted. So I mentioned earlier that this talk is a continuation of the talk 
uh, we did at DEF CON 26. So here is a listing of the devices as well as the carrier and the model and then the vulnerabilities that were present in each. So uh, non-resettable device identifiers, these are uh, data items like the IMA, or the IMA, the Wi-Fi MAC address, Bluetooth MAC address, serial number, the ICC ID. And back in Android 9, there was the read phone state permission, which an application could request. And if the user granted it to the application, then the application could get uh, these non-resettable device identifiers. And then in Android 10, Google made some changes. Uh, so the permission was read privilege phone state instead of read phone state, which made it so that third party applications could no longer access these device identifiers. Although uh, pre installed apps can get the read privilege phone state permission, access the device identifiers, and then leak them to a location which is accessible to a zero permission third party application. And a common leakage location we noticed was system properties. So system properties, this is a system-wide uh, repository of key value pairs. Uh, you can see the get prop being executed with uh, a snippet of the output. And the get prop command can be executed by any application. It doesn't require any permissions. Uh, SE Linux can actually restrict access to certain system property keys. Um, that's the, not the ones we're going to talk about. They're accessible by uh, third party app with uh, zero permissions. So the system properties contain uh, version information of the build, uh, version information about the chipset, status of init services, and much more. And third party applications cannot write to system properties, which is enforced by SE Linux. So here are the system property key names, as well as the uh, non resettable device ID that it leaks, as well as the devices that are impacted. Uh, so you, as you can see here, the IMAs are uh, fairly common, as well as the Bluetooth or the, the Wi-Fi MAC address and the serial number. So based on uh, the previous table, uh, there's just a small code snippet executing the get prop command and then grepping on all of those patterns. And then it reads from the uh, command output and just writes it to the system log. And as you can see here, this is being run on the track phone TCL A3X, which here a zero permission app can get the device IMA, the, uh, the ICC ID, as well as the uh, Bluetooth MAC address. Uh, next, there is on certain Android devices, they contain a system binary from MediaTek called MNLD. And the vulnerability here is whenever uh, the GPS module is active, MNLD will open a debug port on the loopback interface, uh, TCP port 7000, uh, that doesn't perform any authentication or authorization uh, to any clients that connect. It just starts emitting the GPS coordinates. And the attack requirements here is just a local application that has been granted the internet permission. You can see the impacted devices as well as the path. Uh, this uh, system binary executes with the GPS uh, user ID, and you can see the CVE there. And this appeared in MediaTek's May 2023 uh, security bulletin, and they've uh, provided the affected chipsets. Uh, we've noticed there's different uh, behavior among versions, major Android versions for MNLD. So on Android 11, uh, 12, and 13, uh, MNLD will bind to the loopback interface uh, on port 7000, which in hex is 1B58. And then on Android 9 and below, uh, we, it will bind to any IP address. And we observe this uh, going down to an Android 4.4.2 device, which is Android KitKat, uh, which is quite old. And at the bottom is just a source code snippet to connect to uh, port 7000 on the loopback interface, read from the socket, and then write the output uh, to the system log. So here is uh, some output from connecting to the debug port. It emits NMEA sentences. And uh, we've redacted the latitude and longitude from the GPS coordinates here. And we've listed the NMEA sentences that contain the user's uh, GPS or the device's GPS coordinates. Uh, so there's two different uh, attack models you could do. You could have a passive approach where 
uh, an application uh, has, that has the internet permission just periodically pulls port 7000 in the background to see when it's open and whenever it's open, it can then just uh, get the device's GPS coordinates, record this longitudinally. Uh, there's also an active approach where uh, a malicious application can start Google Maps or a similar type of application. And if you've used uh, Google Maps and given it access to your location, then as soon as you start the application's launcher activity, it will immediately activate the GPS module, which will then open uh, TCP port 7000, which an uh, application can then connect to in the background and get the uh, device's uh, GPS coordinates. Uh, we also searched the uh, GN, GGA, uh, and MIA sentence on Shodan, and there's 930 internet facing devices that are emitting uh, that and MIA string, and 913 of them are from port 7000. Uh, next, we're going to talk about the MMI group app. Uh, this is a pre installed app that exposes various capabilities, which I will uh, talk about on the next slide. The attack requirements are just a local app with no permissions necessary. Uh, you can see the impacted devices uh, listed. The package name is com.factory.mmi group. Uh, on all the devices we looked at, it always had a, a version name of 2.1 and a version code of 3. It executes as a system UID, and the reserved CI, uh, CVE ID is shown uh, on the slide. So these are the capabilities that it exposes uh, broken down by device. So there's a factory reset, which I mentioned earlier, is a, a data wipe. It also leaks the device IMA, the device serial number, and exposes arbitrary AT command execution, and uh, you can enable wireless adapters. So the workflow for this is the local uh, malicious app sends an intent to the MMI group receiver in the MMI group app. The MMI group app starts. It then dynamically registers for various action strings. The malicious app then sends uh, a broadcast intent using those uh, action strings that it registered for and puts the embedded data that the MMI group is expecting. The MMI group then either queries some data or performs an action and it, resides, it writes the result to persist.sys ATA ADB result system property. And uh, the malicious app then reads either the data or the the result of executing the action from that same system property, and at the bottom is just the, a small uh, source code snippet to send a broadcast intent which initiates uh, a factory reset. So the more interesting uh, vulnerability here is arbitrary AT command injection. So this application executes the eight, uh, a set AT command for AT plus power where the actual parameter is controlled by uh, an intent extra that an external app can send and the AT power AT command is not actually supported on the devices we examined and it's also not in the 3GPP standard. So to inject our own command, we look at AT plus power equals that string uh, is nine characters. So we uh, inject the uh, backsca or backspace escape sequence nine times or its Unicode equivalent and then put our own AT command and uh, send that broadcast intent and then check the result from the persist sys ATA ADB uh, result system property. So there's a source code snippet there where we inject uh, nine backspace characters and then execute the AT plus CNUM, which returns the device's phone number, which is then read from system properties. So here's a demo on a T-Mobile Rebel 6 uh, Pro 5G. Uh, here's the attack app. Uh, showing that it has no permissions and it's going to execute AT commands in the background. So just getting the device's phone number, getting the IMA, getting the base station ID, which is a proxy for its location, getting the ICC ID, getting the MZ, getting the serial number, calling 911, showing that 911 has been called, and then programmatically hanging up. Uh. <laughs> Uh, next, we have a, another application that also exposes uh, arbitrary AT command execution to co-located apps. 
Uh, the attack requirements is just a local app. It doesn't require any permissions. Uh, the package name is com.trackphone.tf status. As you can see by the, the path, the file name is hiddenmenu.apk. Uh, this executes with the radio UID, which is the, uh, the UID that the telephony framework runs on Android. Uh, so this is a, a very similar type of vulnerability where it's executing a different set AT command where we can control the parameter which is from an intent extra. So this, the only difference is it's 11 characters long uh, and so we just inject 11 uh, backspace characters. And there's also another approach where you can uh, stack additional AT commands by turning that AT command into a, a test AT command by injecting uh, a question mark and then adding additional uh, AT commands which are separated by a carriage return. So at the bottom you can see there that it's just injecting 11 backspace characters, resetting the settings uh, for the modem and then calling 911 again. So we have another hidden menu app and as you can see these applications are not that hidden. Uh, the vulnerability here is that it exposes a programmatic factory reset to co-located apps. Again, it's a data wipe where a user could potentially encounter catastrophic data loss. The attack requirements is a local application uh, that hasn't been granted any permissions. Uh, the impacted device is a Boost Mobile TCL 20XE. Uh, the package name you can see is com.tctgcs hidden menu proxy, uh, the version name, version code, and that it runs as a system UID and at the bottom is essentially just a broadcast intent where you send a, a message or an intent to factory reset receiver and once it uh, starts it just pro programmatically initiates a factory reset. In Android, uh, application components can set uh, an access permission that external applications must possess to interact with them. So here uh, there's a, a vulnerability where it says I, I'm protected by this permission but if that permission isn't declared either by that app, by any other pre-installed apps or the Android framework then a third party app can then declare that permission, set the access requirements for it and then interact with any application components which are supposed to be protected by it. So we observed this in the TCL screen recorder app and the vulnerability here is that it exposes uh, arbitrary file read and write as a system uh, user app to local applications. The attack requirements are just an application that declares the missing permission and then requests it. The impacted device is a track phone and AT&T TCL 30Z. The package name is com.tcl screen recorder and We've provided the version names, version codes, and it runs as a system UID. So the workflow is this malicious app uh, declares and requests the missing permission, which is com.tct.smart.switchphone.permission.switchdata in its manifests and then also requests it. It then binds to the service that uh, requires this access permission that it just uh, declared. Uh, it binds, after it binds to the service it gets an eye binder which it then uh, it embeds into a messenger. It then gets a message from this uh, messenger, creates its own messenger supply and then sets it to the reply to instance field in the message uh, with a what value of one and then sends it to the TCT screen recorder app and this is for bidirectional uh, communication. And then it, uh, on that messenger it invokes function number four uh, which is essentially just a what value of four. It provides the, the file it wants to access which in this case uh, example just SD card DEFCON 31 dot uh, txt on external storage as well as the mode which it would either be read or write. Then the TCT screen recorder app responds to the messenger that was uh, provided in step three that the malicious app receives. Uh, in the, the bundle there's a extra name file descriptor which contains a parcel file descriptor which it can then uh, put into a file input stream for reading or a file output stream for writing and perform whatever operation it wanted to on the file that it indicated. 
So there's uh, something called factory apps. These kind of provide a centralized location for testing of uh, hardware and software functionality. These can come by many different names, engineering apps or hidden menu apps, factory apps. These generally cannot be disabled uh, or uninstalled by the user. You would need root access or potentially an exploit to remove or disable them. They run with a system UID, uh, which makes them quite privileged. Uh, generally, there's no launcher activity, so the user is unlikely to actually use them. So we talked about the MMI group already. Uh, now we'll cover the FQC app as well as the Transion factory app. So the uh, Evenwell FQC app, this exposes local arbitrary command execution uh, to co-located applications. The attack requirements is just a local app with no permissions necessary. And the impacted devices are the Verizon Sharp Rovo 5 and the TrackPhone BlueView 2. The package name is com.evenwell.fqc. You can see the, the vulnerable version names, version codes, the path it runs is a system UID and the uh, reserved uh, CVE ID. So this one kind of has a interesting workflow. The malicious app starts a, the show barometer activity. The FQC app then starts this activity. And when this activity comes into the foreground as part of its on resume activity lifecycle, it sets a system property called persist.sys prevent power key to a value of on. And if this uh, activity moves into the background as part of its on pause activity lifecycle callback, it sets the system property to off. And to actually execute commands in the context of this app, the persist.sys prevent power key system property needs to have a value of on, and FQC app cannot have a foreground activity uh, which it checks before executing a command. So the way we achieve this is we crash the app while that activity is in the foreground. So we send a broadcast intent to FQC broadcast receiver with a null action string, which at runtime the application does not check to see whether this uh, action string is null. It operates on it and encounters a null pointer exception. And this sets the requirements where we have the system property to the desired value and there are no uh, activity components of the FQC app in the foreground, which the FQC service checks before it will execute a command. So we then we send it uh, an intent with uh, the command we want to execute in the turn off heater uh, string extra. And executing uh, commands in the context of a system UID app is very powerful. This is a very limited uh, set of uh, capabilities. You can grant arbitrary permissions to apps. You can install apps and then grant them the permissions. You can perform a factory reset. You can record the device's uh, screen from the background. You can drive the GUI by injecting arbitrary uh, input events and then also perform operations with app ops. So here we have a, a demo. We have bad app, which is going to install an app programmatically using this uh, vulnerability uh, called all perms and then granted all permissions uh, available to a third party application. And this is on the, the track phone BlueView 2, uh, just going to the app info, showing that this application does not have any permissions. We're going to run it, start that activity crash it, and then interact with the FQC service in the background uh, to install an app, and then grant it uh, all the permissions uh, available to a third party app. So there it is, all perms, uh, going to its permissions. Uh, this shows kind of the course view of the permissions it has, and then moving to the more granular, uh, you can see that this has quite a few permissions, which uh, could be abused to uh, surveil uh, the user. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so the best we can tell, this uh, even while Digitech um, uh, company that created the app, they have, uh, they're a Taiwanese company, they have an app on uh, Google Play, a test app, and this used to be on uh, Nokia devices which uh, were on Android N and Android O or uh, Nougat and Oreo 7 and 8, and then they removed it in Android 9 or Android Pi due to a battery issue. And then looking at uh, honhai.com, there's a PDF there that shows the, the ownership of this Evenwell Digitech uh, Inc. company, which it's owned by Foxconn. 
so here's another uh, application that exposes the uh, same vulnerability, exposes local arbitrary command execution as a system user to co-located apps. Again, you just need a local app. Uh, that hasn't been granted or doesn't request any permissions. The vulnerable device is the ITEL Vision 3 Turbo. It's an unlocked device. Uh, the package name is com.transion.autotest factory. You see the, uh, the file path, it's uh, factory.apk, the version name, uh, version code, and runs as a system UID. And uh, in this workflow, uh, the malicious app needs a file system location that's both readable and writable. Uh, to the malicious app and the factory app. So it takes, it takes its base scope storage directory, makes it globally readable, writable, and executable. It then uh, creates a shell script in this directory uh, with whatever commands it wants to execute, makes it uh, globally readable and executable. And then it uh, creates another file. Uh, it needs a specific file name. Uh, that's expected by the factory app, uh, run script file.txt. And in this app, it essentially just runs our shell script in a shell uh, that was from step two, makes this file globally readable and executable. It then interacts with a, a broadcast receiver component named command receiver, and it sends the uh, file path uh, to the uh, run script file. And then the factory app in the command receiver, it reads the contents of that file, which executes a script. Um, and then it writes it to shared preferences. The uh, command receiver then starts monkey background service, which then reads from shared preferences and executes uh, the script with uh, system privileges. Uh, next, we're going to talk about some uh, ZTE specific uh, vulnerabilities. Uh, there's three of them that we discovered. The most severe is the first one, which is an arbitrary file write as the Android system, which is system server. If you're familiar with Android, this is the Android framework. This is what most applications request uh, functionality and data from. And uh, this, the way this is accomplished is by a, a zip file that employs uh, relative paths. Uh, using path traversal attacks. There's also a, another vulnerability where you can start arbitrary activity components in the context of a system UI app where all the intent fields are externally controlled except for the action string. And then lastly, there's a vulnerability where you can delete arbitrary files uh, or delete uh, directories recursively in the context of the settings app which runs with a system UID and all three of these vulnerabilities do not require any permissions except the last one checks to see that you have one of four different package names where none of these package names are actually installed. So uh, you can boot up Android Studio and create an application with whatever package name you want uh, to fulfill this. And it doesn't check the actual app signatures. It's just checking the package name, which obviously is not secure. So this is from uh, ZTE's uh, security bulletin showing the uh, impacted um, devices up to what version is impacted and as well as the software version that it was uh, fixed in. Uh, so this is the workflow. We have a, a local malicious application. It creates an Android X file provider and it just needs a URI authority that starts with uh, com.zte.beautify. Uh, because it system server checks with uh, string starts with instead of strings equals, which is obviously more discriminating. Uh, so we just create an example URI authority of com.zte beautify underscore potatoes. And the malicious app then in its assets directory, uh, like within the application, it then unpacks a zip file to uh, its internal storage to a directory that is shareable by its file provider. It then grants system server, which it has a package name of Android, uh, read access uh, to this zip file that it just unpacked using the standard API uh, from the context class called grant URI permission. It then broadcasts an intent with an action string of com.zte theme, um, theme change uh, you, with a, the, the URI to this uh, zip file which is employing uh, path traversal attacks uh, using a, an extra named 
theme underscore URI, and theme ID can be any arbitrary string. Uh, system server then unpacks this zip file, which we granted it read access to. Uh, it doesn't enforce any constraints on any of the file types or file names. It also doesn't uh, protect against um, any of the path traversal attacks. It doesn't canonicalize the path and enforce any constraints there. Um, so it essentially just, in its context, uh, executing a system UID as like the Android framework itself overwrites uh, files. And in certain cases, depending on uh, what is overwritten, uh, a third party application can cause uh, a uh, system crash just by an uncaught exception in the system server process to trigger initialization routines. Say if you did overwrite uh, another application or overwrite the screen lock database with uh, a screen lock database copy that does not require uh, any pin or uh, pattern. So here are just uh, some uh, the use cases. You can uninstall apps. You can overwrite applications. You can overwrite app libraries. You can overwrite the screen lock, which will work uh, once after you perform a uh, system reboot. And at the bottom, you can see the crafted uh, zip file. Uh, it's called notevil.zip. And as you can see, it's using uh, relative paths, which move up the file system and then overwrite the lock settings database as well as its journal file. Uh, so here we have a video from the ZTE Axon 40 showing that we have a screen lock. And this is done with another phone just because we have to do a, a system crash um, and to show it in one take. So we just showed that we have some uh, pictures there. This is the attack application showing that it has no permissions. So now we start an arbitrary component, perform a phone call. We don't have service on this device. Uh, we delete the user's photos. And then we're going to start uh, WhatsApp, showing it's the official legitimate version of WhatsApp. Then we go back to the uh, POC app. We overwrite the screen lock database as well as WhatsApp uh, with a repackaged version, uh, cause a system crash. Now it's going to boot up, showing that the device no longer has a screen lock. Uh, so there was no screen lock there. We open up the photos. Users' photos are gone. And now we uh, run WhatsApp, which is our own version, which is just kind of a silly version. But uh, if we wanted to be malicious, we could have a repackaged version of WhatsApp that appears to be WhatsApp that gets the user's data uh, surreptitiously uh, and sends it uh, off. <laughs> And so just uh, to summarize, looking at uh, some of these vulnerabilities, uh, some of the root causes, there's definitely uh, some failure to perform access control at application component boundaries, at interfaces, on network sockets. Um, also, uh, when you are you know, unzipping uh, a zip file, you certainly want to canonicalize the path and enforce some constraints. Uh, in Android 14, app applications that target Android 14, there are some uh, platform defenses uh, which are going to prevent um, escaping using uh, relative paths. And if you try and protect your application component with a permission, and this permission isn't declared anywhere, it obviously doesn't provide uh, any protection. And in many cases, we saw a lack of a whitelist, would it, which could at least kind of constrain what a user could do and limit the impact instead of having it be completely unbounded. And also relying on just the package name of an application doesn't provide you with um, any real security. As I mentioned earlier, you know, you can create, use Android Studio and create any arbitrary activity or arbitrary app with whatever uh, package name you wanted. And just uh, some suggestions. So vendors um, could use some showing, looking at these vulnerabilities, uh, some sort of proactive scanning of devices actually before they uh, reach uh, the the user, also maybe some sort of certification showing that the device has undergone some sort of security analysis. Enterprises need to constantly monitor and regularly scan assets. 
um, in or order to enforce uh, security policies. Uh, the user, if you see some of these uh, pre-installed applications, uh, you know, you may want to uh, disable them. And if there is a pre-installed application that's vulnerable to uh, arbitrary uh, command injection, if you execute that command, you can have the application disable itself. So to kind of close that uh, vulnerability. And uh, the way we find these vulnerabilities is a firmware pipeline where you can run a, a firmware image or a set of applications, run it through some static analysis engines, uh, use, looking for violations using uh, vulnerability patterns, applying some uh, filters to it, and then uh, creating a POC. And uh, after introducing all these vulnerabilities, uh, Quokka has an application called uh, QScout, which you can download for free and run it on your device to see if your device is impacted by any of these vulnerabilities. And uh, the QR code uh, takes you to the uh, Google Play link uh, to download the application. And uh, just to wrap it up, so third-party applications, even though they may appear limited, they can interact with their environment uh, looking for insecure interfaces of privileged uh, pre-installed software. And anytime you, you know, have some software and it, it goes out there, I mean, you should assume that people are going to spend copious amounts of time reverse engineering your software, looking for software flaws. And uh, as shown by this presentation, privileged preloaded software could use uh, some increased security vetting. And you should read our paper. Uh, it goes into much more detail, has POC code. Uh, it's about 70 pages. And uh, you can contact us at oem at quokka.io. Uh, try the QScout app uh, to see if your device is vulnerable. And if you would like to uh, continue the conversation, we'll be at Yard House at Link uh, at 1.30 today. And uh, like to, that's all for the presentation. I'd like to thank you uh, for attending. And it looks like we have two minutes, maybe. I don't know if that's enough for questions, but if there are. Uh, Um, of those, uh, the, the Blade um, X1 from Visible, it didn't have any of those vulnerabilities. It was actually part of the, the data set but didn't contain any vulnerabilities. Uh, if you were limiting it to that set of devices, yes. Uh, All right, well, uh, if there's no more questions, uh, thank you very much for uh, attending the talk. <laughs>